I'm Claudine Wong, joining you from the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm joined now by Dr. Suji Hamilton, who is the former director of palliative care at NYU at Woodhall. Thank you so much for joining us. We have talked before. It's always great to talk to you. Hey, it's always great to talk to you too, Claudine, and I'm happy to see you. I am happy to see you too. I wish we had uh, more uplifting things to talk about, but you know, as we are knee deep and I should say neck deep into this coronavirus pandemic, it has certainly forced all of us to think about things that I think a lot of us don't like to think about, you know, as our loved ones and our friends and our family, and we worry about ourselves getting, getting sick. But I think the discussions are so important because if we do this now, um, then it, it saves us in, if we are in a situation where things are hard. And that's really what you focus on too, really with palliative care and, and helping people when they're either recovering or struggling. That's an important thing of, of, of mindset, right? Absolutely. That mindset, you know, we all are suffering and we're all like, you know, we've said so many times before, we're, we're in it together, but we're all suffering from our own personal situations that some, some of which we share with other people and some of which we don't. And it can all be very isolating and difficult to deal with, um, particularly also being a caregiver. There are a lot of caregivers who are home a lot more and having to deal with the person that they're caring for. Yep, and that's palliative care. I want to explain for people who are sitting here going, tell me palliative care. Explain that to people in terms of what that means in, in terms of care for people. Sure. So it's a medical specialty that really focuses on optimizing the quality of life for a person and dealing with whatever symptoms that they have in a very high quality way. We're specially trained to do that. We work with their other physicians. We don't take over the role of their primary care physician, but we work along with them to provide an extra meaningful layer of support to them so that all of their needs are met. And a huge part of this is also knowing what their wishes would be so that we can honor that the whole way from the time of diagnosis all the way until the end of their life, really. And we've talked about this before in terms of, of normally in a normal hospital situation, the, a, a doctor might say we need a palliative care physician in here as well. And then it's a, it's a collaboration. It, it's gotten a little more complicated in this COVID-19 uh, world that we're living in, but certainly um, that position within someone who is struggling would be someone normally, if someone was having respiratory problems on the ventilator, having times when we may not know their wish, there becomes a point where they may not be able to express their wishes, someone in palliative care would be really instrumental in helping. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought up a case of a ventilator because so many people that are even unexpected to be on one are with COVID-19, that when someone's on a ventilator, when they're intubated, when the breathing tube is put down their breathing tube in order to attach the tube that attaches them to the ventilator to help them breathe if they're not able to breathe on their own, very often we're giving them a sedative along with that because having that breathing tube can be really uncomfortable physically as well as having to synchronize their breathing with the machine, the sedative helps with, with many things. So that sedative itself, along with the actual medical condition, may make it difficult for them to communicate. So sedative or not, their medical condition can evolve either in a positive way or a negative way. So having someone there and, and, and having the patient before that, having decided who they'd want as their medical decision maker ahead of time, is really important because that only comes into play if you're unable to communicate. If you're able to communicate, you are our source of information. As long as a person's in sound mind and able to make medical decisions, they are our source of information and decision making. And do you find that having someone who is your person, whoever that person is, who knows that having that conversation is soothing for whoever is in the position who can no longer communicate, knowing that I don't have to try to communicate because I've already told the person who is going to be my person, my caregiver, my palliative care physician, what, what I want. And so that is one less thing I have to worry about. If it's someone on, on a ventilator with COVID, I can focus on just trying to get out of, out of this, hopefully, and I don't have to worry about that part. That is such an important point because we are trying to optimize the comfort of our patients. So them knowing that is a huge comfort, but also for the person that they chose as a medical decision maker, it's a huge comfort for them because whatever discussions the doctors are having with them, whatever decisions they're making, the burden of being the decision maker under duress is hard enough as it is, but mm -hmm. the decisions you are making are the ones that that patient chose. You are being their voice and their yes, advocate. So you don't have to decide, you just have to relay, which is actually a, a, a better 
position, I think, for people to be in. Because being a caregiver in general, I think, is just, you know, I know people who are in that position, they want to be the caregiver. They want to do this for the person that they love. It's not that they don't want to, but that does not make it any easier. I mean, that is a very, very difficult role to be in. It is. It's noble. And you probably chose to be that caregiver because you're a loving person. You have a really special relationship with this person and you want them to be healthy and safe and taken care of. So I have a special place in my heart for caregivers for doing this and putting themselves out there because sometimes very often becoming a caregiver really comes without warning and you still have the reg your regular life duties. Maybe you're still a spouse. Maybe you're still a parent. Maybe you still have to put food on the table. So you're juggling all of these things and it can be really, really difficult and lead to a lot of stress. I just want to talk about what a caregiver is. You know, a caregiver is, could be anyone, a loved one, a family member, a friend, hired help that's taken on the responsibility to regularly care for someone, whether they're a child, whether they're elderly, whether they're disabled or ill. And like I said, a lot of times this comes without warning. If someone, your loved one, for example, had a stroke and they need you, you feel really, really, it's very difficult for you to express the mm -hmm. guilt and the fear and the anxiety that you're having. Because if, you, if I asked my patient's families, they'd say, I would always take care of my mother, no matter what. I don't care if I don't get a second of sleep. I'm going to take care of my mother after everything she's done for me. And that's very noble. And it, it, it does warm my heart to hear that. But I worry about the caregiver and the stress that they're putting upon themselves that they're unable to, to shed or to share or, or to get respite from. Well, I think, right, there's the, the intention and then there is the implementation of every best intention that we have and then the reality of the toll it takes on everyone involved and especially whether it is a short-term but very intense situation or a long-term drawn out you know situation where it just slowly just you know the things that we can't control eat away at us i i think in large part i agree or like you're so right our intentions are to do 110 percent, but realistically sometimes we can only do 50 and that's a huge part of dealing with caregiver stress as i said caregiver stress is really due to lack of respite or or relief from being a caregiver and we want to try to control that because we don't want it to to evolve into something called caregiver burnout mm -hmm. that could really look a lot like depression well and then yeah, we have to understand right if we are not in a good place then we don't give care as well as we we'd want to as well so it benefits both people to take care of the caregiver yes exactly yeah. and that's why they have to be able to identify early on with their sources of happiness and joy and relief whether that's people whether that's online resources whether that's community resources they have to identify them early yeah, that's so important. Okay, let's talk about this article that you were a part of, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Eight <laughs> Habits of the Successful Caregivers, because this is great, because sometimes it just takes a while. How did you, you know, how do we know that, I mean, these eight habits are the, the ones that are really going to make the difference, and, and then we can go through each one of them to kind of just give people an understanding of, of, of what they should be doing. Sure. Um, well, very often when I'm dealing with my palliative care cases, I'm talking to the caregiver. A lot of times their diagnosis where the people are very elderly, where they're unable to uh, make decisions for themselves for whatever reason, like in dementia and other conditions, whether they're on a ventilator, as you've said, and whether they actually turf the decision making to the surrogate decision maker. And I'm having the conversations with them. So I'm learning a lot from the caregivers about what stresses them and what kind of help that they need. So I took that and I put it together to contribute to this article. And, um, and I great. actually have a, I actually have a book coming out, but uh, oh, publication, fantastic. thank yeah. you very much. Publication, thank you so much. Publication is delayed because of COVID-19, but that's yeah. okay. I'm gonna share some of the, the tools here. Okay, that we're so talking let's, today. Let's go through it. Educate themselves, knowledge is power. And, and what does that mean in terms of how specific we need to you know to learn about about a condition or you know i mean is that is that getting super medical or is that just you know learning about what we kind of need to do to to best meet needs yes so in my book i've included something that i call my, the three e's that i found to be successful for a lot of caregivers and patients and the first e is education 
And education means ask the physician questions until you are satisfied with the information they've given you. Mm-hmm. A doctor can, can, can be very um, well-educated and well-versed, but sometimes the communication channel, he, can speak, he or she can speak like a doctor, and maybe you just need information about what you need to take care of your loved one. So you need to ask questions that are important to you and find out as much as possible. I'd even go as far as to ask the physician what he or she anticipates your loved one may need down the road so you can plan. And one question that we've talked about before, actually you and I, that I've learned is so important for patients is to ask them or the care receiver is, what's most important to you? And when you find that out, it leads me to my second E. The second E is empowerment. When you find out what they want, you're able to formulate a meaningful plan that is a whole that may have ups and downs and will continue to evolve. But every decision that you make is being guided and directed by what your loved one wants. And that should give you a lot of comfort and confidence in making these certain plans and decisions. And then early planning. Early planning goes along with also having decisions in place. If you haven't already initiated these discussions, having discussions like power of attorney, advanced directives like medical circuit decision maker, what interventions your your loved one may or may not want, what end of life decisions there are, what they may or may not want at the end of life, and even things like if their level of need increases to the point where maybe you're unable to care for them adequately, would they be open? to going to a nursing home if it was, if, if it seemed like, like the right thing for them? Would uh, hospice services be something that they'd be open to if they needed it? These aren't easy discussions to have, but finding the right time, initiating the concept early rather than under duress when it's actually happening is better. Yeah, no, that, that's important. That's such important information. And I think, you know, preparation is key. The, the next tip is caregivers should be prepared to delegate you know, and I think that's a, that's a difficult one for people to, if they feel like the responsibility is on them to be able to say, you know, someone else could, could step in and take on this role if need be. Yes. So I would say you have to write things on paper. First of all, you need to plan, put things on paper, prioritize what's on the paper, because when you look at it on paper, you're going to actually realize everything you thought you could do, you're probably not able to. It's a lot. And the list is probably long. Right. It's probably really long. And your intention, as you mentioned intention, your intention is to do it all and to do it all really well. But you may not be able to. So if it's going to help you, start bringing family, other family into the discussion. Um, And I think we forget that other people want to help. They like being, people want to be able to be a part of the process too, and they don't want to not, they don't want to disrupt it, but they don't mind saying, hey, I could use, I could use a little help here and and people will step up in a minute. Absolutely. And you know what, we, sometimes we want to control the situation because we think we can do it best and we know our loved one best. And that may be true actually, but maybe you really this, okay, this, so this is something different. You have to identify what's going to give you relief. So if you do that, you can even ask a family member, uh, I really need to go on a walk. Like, I really need yeah. to leave the house for one hour. Can you just on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. or, uh, you know, can you, just, can you just come in and just watch mm-hmm. her or him for that hour? It would really make a huge difference to me for this entire week. Can you call me? Can you just like every night at seven, you know, while she's watching her favorite show, I really need to talk to someone, right. you know. Yes, I think that that can be so helpful. It's it's not a big deal for the person you're asking, but it can make a huge deal if you are, are feeling overwhelmed. And I think that goes to the next point of practice self-care. And that's what we talked about, right? To, in order to be the best caregiver you can be, you also have to, to think about yourself. And that's not being selfish. That's simply just being aware that, that we all need some self-care. Absolutely. And you said it best. In order to be the best caregiver, you have to take care of yourself. And please, please do not feel any guilt in doing this. You need to do this. Your loved one wants you to do this. It is easy. It is easy to feel <laughs> guilty about everything. I think, I think people in general do. And, and, but I think, if, I, I think the little stuff, right? If you need a nap, if you need to go for a walk, if you need to if you just want to watch your favorite show for an hour and be uninterrupted because that is your escape 
then that is okay. It is okay to do that. And it doesn't mean that you're valuing that over the person that you love, you know, most. Exactly. It's, it's just and and think about why you're doing it. It's more than okay. You're doing it so you can be better yeah. for them, better for yourself. You're protecting both of you if you do this. I think parents understand that too, right? They're better parents if they come back for that project or their craft, if they're not trying to slam it all into to one thing. They're better parents too when they're more settled and they take a break and they do some self-care when it's going to the gym for an hour, they come back and they're, they're better at dinner time than if, you know, although we can't go to the gym, so maybe they walk around the block. <laughs> or whatever in this day that we're in. Home gyms. Home gyms, yes, right? Because all these things, you know, Finding a different way to care is, is, is important. And then let's go to the next one. This is the find the lighter side. And that is, you know, some days that feels so hard to do, but I think, you know, when we, when we laugh and we do something, when we, it does, uh, it, it does change it for people. It is. And it, it is hard to do. It really is, but you have to identify it. And that might be, like you had said, something you're watching, something you're reading, or a person, a person you're talking to, um, a certain publication. You know, you have to find out, again, it has to be particular to you. You have to find out what makes you smile, what makes you laugh. And I think that goes along with uh, self-care, really. Yeah, and I, and I think this next one is, is really interesting because it is something, again, like some of these tips are so much about just life, right, in, in general. like. You know, you treasure your relationships and this is don't alienate your loved one by taking on your role as a caregiver and seeing yourself as just that. I mean, that's a great mm -hmm. quote from you about, you know, really, you know, just not losing yourself in the space as, as well, right? Yes. And it's so easy to do because you cut, we get caught up in being perfect at what we're doing as a caregiver. But when you really alienate that that relationship the whole reason you became a caregiver is because you love this person and you're close to this person if she's mom you have to continue treating her like mom because guess what she wants to be mom she doesn't want to just yeah. be your care receiver so do and my I, best i would argue someone would want to be the daughter too right like exactly you want, to, you want that too it's not just for her but you want that that space that you've always lived in and always been a part of as well Exactly. Things are already shaken up more than we want them to be, that you want to preserve and maintain that relationship as much as possible um, and allow them to feel as much like them and you as much like you as possible. As difficult as it may be, it will help you in the long run. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, these, these next tips are like, I feel like they're, they're kind of all connected, right? Caregivers should ask for help. They should put systems in place, I think, to, to get them that help. And then... <laughs> Really, couldn't we all just cut ourselves some slack here? I mean, <laughs> we, we are, you know, doing the best we can. And, and, and I think, you know, in large part, right, can't, that, that has to be good enough on a lot of days because cause it is good enough. It, it has to be. And you said the best, you said the best phrase. We are doing the best we can. And that's all you can do. Number one, safety first, always. Mm -hmm. Number two is you do the best that you can. And number three, you have to see that person as a person and not just something that you're caring for, for both of you. You need to do that. Um, you know, you talked about in this COVID age, in this COVID age, sometimes you're isolating in isolation together and that can make things even more challenging. You may actually have less physical time together, depending on the situation. You have to see every moment that you're in contact with each other, or I should say when you interact with each other, as quality time. If you're giving them a, a meal, put a little note on the tray. If you see something in a magazine or newspaper, cut it out for them. FaceTime from the next room if you have to. And don't forget to say, I love you. I know. So, so important. And I think how we frame up anything, right? It helps all those all those around us because these are difficult discussions and we don't want to be in these situations and i think caregivers are, are frustrated to see their loved ones in various conditions and and whether they're improving or not improving um but that's why i guess the framework is so important because it's all the stuff we can't control i guess the framework is the one thing we we can control in that space and that's a really important point because i think we also have to pay attention to the fact that things may not go as planned which is you know, one of those discussions that we don't 
want to have, but that's why it's so great to talk to you because you guide us through those discussions, you know, and, and help us through it. Because I think, unfortunately, this is a, is a place where, um, you know, we have to have some discussions because that, that moment, however difficult it is, will make the other moments, hopefully, if not easier, smoother, which in essence would be a little bit easier. So you got to take the weight off somewhere. You have to, and you have to allow yourself that relief. I also just want to say, if you have any questions, you can always call the doctor, but also the case manager and the social worker taking care of your loved one are really good resources of information. No, it's important to not be scared to ask questions. Do you think people don't like to, to, I always think people feel like they're bugging someone, right? They're bothering yeah. them. And, I, and I, I, I think, you know, we're not doctors, you are, <laughs> but the, the rest of us, you know, right. there's so many things we don't, we don't know. And you're not expected to be a doctor. No one's expecting you to be that. Every, you know, everyone understands you're a loved one that, that cares enough this, about this person enough to take on the responsibility at the expense of finances and time and, and your life sometimes. This, this article that we just referenced is on the Blue Cross Blue Shield Minnesota Caregiver Corner. So if you want to go back through over that and, you know, take a look and say, hey, you know, this is where you know, I want to, I want to write those down. They can, they can do that, that as well. And then you were mentioning AARP, which is a great, a great resource, even if, yes. you know, even if you are not in the AARP age, you know, unfortunately we are dealing with some, some issues that, uh, that AARP has addressed. And so that's a great place to go. It is, it is. I know it's traditionally for over a certain age group, but I found the information really helpful and I remembered what I wanted to tell you. Oh, good. And that, <laughs> and that is when you were talking about it, because I love talking to you. Everything that you, you talk about ignites something else interesting in me yeah, and that's why I just love working with you. Um, but guilt, guilt is a big thing. I found in my practice that, you know, there are, among other things, there are definitely two things, guilt and or loss that contribute to suffering. And when you're a caregiver, guilt can be so overwhelming because you don't want to tell people that you're tired from looking after someone that you love, that maybe you don't even want to do it today. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel really uncomfortable telling other people for fear of people thinking, well, I mean, that you're not a good, a good daughter or that you don't, uh, you know, you don't you're, being you're being selfish. Yes. Well, yeah. And I think that it's, it's really easy to fall in, into that space. It's really easy to be hard on yourself about everything in it, and especially the things that matter to us most, which is our loved ones, right? Yes. If, if I feel guilty about the things that don't matter, like cleaning the house and organizing <laughs> that closet, well, then when it comes to the people in my life who, you know, I'd walk through fire for, the guilt comes on like a torrential downpour for sure. Um, I couldn't have described it any better, and I agree with you. It can be really overwhelming. Yeah. Well, this is a fantastic conversation. I always really like talking to you, Dr. Hamilton, because you're always so full of great advice and really some, some really hard, fast ways to, to work through it. And so I look forward to our continuing conversation. And uh, thank you so much. I think the caregivers out there, and there are so many and so many who may become caregivers, you know, as we work through this COVID-19 pandemic, um, that this is all good information for all of us to really take to heart. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for this okay. education that we're giving the public. Yep. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy. You too. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.